Welcome everyone to this chess video. Here we're going to go over chess.com's new personality quiz. Now I remember taking the old quiz in a video a long time ago, so you can check that one out if you're interested. But here we're going to take a look at this completely new quiz, so curious to see how I do. And so let's just get started. If you want to follow along, of course you can just pause the video at each question, answer it yourself, and you can take the test along with me, or you can just watch this for entertainment. But okay, let's just get started with the quiz. So which statement better describes how you would decide whether to sacrifice the knight with knight captures g5? Um, so here I would just probably calculate some superficial lines, kind of get a feel more for the position, kind of go from there. In this case, both of them seem playable, whether to take on g5 or just retreat the bishop. I'd probably be tempted to more just retreat the bishop and just maintain the fact that, you know, they've advanced their pawns so far, and now that's a permanent weakness that maybe we could take advantage of long term. So although I do use intuition in my decision-making process, I'd say calculate different variations is probably what my answer is closest to. It's 1 a.m. on Friday, and your opponent just flagged you in a completely losing position. What do you do? Uh, okay, well, uh, like most chess players, this has definitely happened to me a lot of the time. I actually play a lot of chess really late at night, but that's, of course, because my schedule is a little bit flipped here because I'm constantly recording YouTube videos for all of you. I'm completely fine with that. But if I'm ever playing, I'm always in constant awareness of where my mental state is at. And so I made a chess video on carrying tilt and also another video on the stop loss system that I have for chess. So check those out if that's something you struggle with. But in general, I'll try and be very disciplined and I will probably quit after that game. Now, occasionally I will take very calculated shots where sometimes I will risk a little bit and I will continue playing, but that's a little bit outside of the scope of this because it is a personal decision where I figure the rating literally doesn't matter and it's about the experience. So if you're actually tilted and you care that much about rating, then you're probably better in the long run to just stop for the time being. Now, if you use it as a learning experience and you try and get through things, because if it's a several round tournament, you don't have the option of just taking a break with the next round coming up, you know? So you might have to kind of practice the skill of learning that if you lose one game, it's just a game and you have to move on and go to the next one. So I'd probably say call it quits and go to bed, even though there's been many times I have gone much later than that. In this position, what would you play first? Um, so I think I actually recognize this position. It's a very common e4 opening. I'll kind of show this on the board for other people. I'll just use a little bit of editing and kind of insert into some diagrams. We can discuss it. But okay, in this position here, my instinct is definitely just play knight f3. I just want to develop my pieces, get castled, and have no problems whatsoever. f4 I just think is too weakening for no purpose. Um, I guess the main idea would be that you get your knight behind the f pawn, and then you can maybe play some kingside attack. But here, I'm just more comfortable to simply castle and play more solidly. Especially the fact that after our f-pawn advances, this entire diagonal here from a7 to g1 is much weaker. And with their bishop on c5, I would much rather just play it with knight f3. Alright, now this position here probably comes up from a move order either this or very similar. Probably e4, e5, bishop c4, knight c6, knight c3, knight f6 d3, bishop c5, and then here's the position we're talking about, which we either play knight f3 or play pawn to f4. Now, I'd much prefer knight f3 here, as mentioned. I think it's just safer to get your piece developed and then get castled. Now, interestingly enough, the engine does say knight f3 is objectively best, so I can't really be too wrong there. But if we look at the database, something that I wasn't familiar with at the time, and I'll put a picture on the screen here, in large for everyone, is actually pawn to f4 is the most popular move here. And so this looks tried and tested, and apparently gives the best practical results. Now for me, it's still much more natural to just play knight f3 and develop, but apparently f4 is a really playable alternative, despite the fact that you are actually weak on this entire diagonal after this pawn is developed to f3, or especially f4. You can take a free piece on this move, or you think you can force checkmate, but it's complicated. What do you do? This is a thing where I'm currently working on my calculation, so I would like to say I would calculate to checkmate, but I have to be honest with this quiz, and that is simply not what I would do. Um, quite be honest, little secret here, I take the free piece. And the reason I do that is just because it's very simple, and for me, a lot of it is clarity. I'm constantly seeking for clarity in the position, in the past, I used to simplify too much trying to reach end games um, because I knew I could win a lot of those end games and convert, but in doing so, I'd give up a lot of my advantage. 
I made a chess video a long time ago on why that's actually a mistake. One very painful game I experienced, which kind of illustrated that concept really well. But even now, if there's a situation like that, I'd probably just take the free piece. Now, if I was kind of sure I could go for checkmate, I'd definitely be investigating it. But if I wasn't really sure, and the other one is an easy win, I'm just going to take the win. Even if it's not the most efficient route. How do you react when your opponent starts trash talking? Um, definitely keeping calm and focusing on the game. So, yeah, I wouldn't be thrilled about trash talking, but you can't let other people get to you. You have to focus on your game, and your opponent, quite frankly, does not matter. It reminds me of a famous quotation from Akiba Rubenstein when he was asked who his opponent was. He said, for the next game, I have the black pieces. <laughs> he just doesn't care at all who his opponent is. He's just there to play chess, and it's just one army against the other. If you could only play one time control for the rest of your life, which would you pick? I definitely pick Rapid. I really don't play Bullet hardly at all. Blitz I do play some occasionally. Maybe every other week I'll play an Untitled Tuesday. Um, but in general, I definitely play at least 10 minutes on chess.com. And 10 minutes is my favorite time control, which I consider Rapid. Sometimes I'll even play longer than that, so definitely I prefer to play Rapid. How many moves ahead do you typically calculate? So for me, it's definitely just one move, the best move. I think that's a much better answer. As far as I can, I know a lot of people who are like that. Some people are really impressive at calculating. Of course, Nakamura with a GIF is a really famous example of that. But quite simply, you don't have to calculate that far. And if I have some intuition of the position, then I can navigate without having to rely on so much calculation. Now, of course, I can calculate a forced line for miles, but for the most part in a very complicated position, just one or two moves might actually be enough. It's very rare that I calculate more than just three, four, or five moves in a game, unless I think I can go for a checkmate or something. Kind of interesting with the last question we had to checkmate, but if I still can't see it fully and it's a little bit murky, I'm probably just taking the free piece. But we've already answered that question. I'm only calculating the best move. And as far as you can go, it's impressive, but it's not a skill I currently possess, or my natural thought process. If you could only play one Puzzle Rush mode for the rest of your life, which would you pick? Definitely Puzzle Rush Survival, maybe because my goal a long time ago was to get at least a 50. I did do that years ago, and I made a blog post about it. 3-Minute I used to play a long, long time ago. I haven't played any 3-Minute in a long time, but if I have to choose, I think Survival is probably my choice. What would you play in this position? Um, either not resisting bishop captures h7 sacrifice, or play a move to improve your position and prepare an attack. And very similar to the very first question we had in this quiz, I'd be kind of calculating some loose lines. Definitely my candidate move first would be bishop captures h7, because that's a very forcing check. The knight is coming to g5. Maybe the queen will come to h5 very quickly, kind of that Greek gift idea. If their king instead comes to g6, then we'll have queen g4. And this is something that we would have to see if it works or not. Alternative, if we were trying to improve the attack first, maybe I would probably play something like queen e1. But the problem here is I think after queen e1, I foresee a move like, like pawn g6, and I don't actually think we have as much, because then our bishop on d3, the whole diagonal has been blocked off to h7, and I actually don't see a way that we're continuing the attack. So I think I probably wouldn't be able to resist bishop captures h7 because it's something that we have to do now or never. Otherwise, I'd try and prepare the attack, but I think that's my first instinct, bishop captures h7. So if you recall, my intuition here on this question was that we play bishop captures h7 check because I thought that g6, I didn't really see a way to continue the attack. And it turns out that although my logic was pretty good, my considered move queen to e1 is slightly better according to the engine. So this is actually slightly preferred and is the best move. Now the reason why though is after g6, there is a very surprising move that I missed, which is actually pawn to g4. Pawn g4 is objectively best, although h4 was also a good move. Now both of these have the same idea, where you're continuing to attack their king, and now you're actually trying to use pawn levers against the new g6 pawn, which might actually turn out to be a weakness for black. It's not really in line with what I was thinking, because if I'm trying to play for an attack, it was more natural for me to sacrifice an h7 and then go for the common Greek gift pattern that I'm familiar with. But if I play queen to e1, I was trying to play more positional, I wouldn't play the g4 pawn move, and I'd try and get my queen either to g3 or h4, and then play a more slow attack where I make some kind of buildup. If you play g4, that's not really in the slow buildup mindset, and so although it's objectively best, it's a little bit more outside the scope of what I was trying to play for. 
When you look at a chess position, what are you more likely to do first? Evaluate each player's king safety or count the material? Definitely count the material. And I try to be very systematic that whenever I see a new position, I do certain things in certain order just to kind of make sure that I don't miss anything. And the very first thing I do with every position is count the material. And that's something that I've actually gotten really good at, whether you be in person looking at tournament games from the boards next to you, or whether you be seeing a chess puzzle for the first time. Maybe I'll make a video on how to count material really efficiently, but it's an important skill to be able to know the material just at a quick glance. So definitely count the material is what I do first. What is the first thing you do when you finish a game? Run game review to learn from my mistakes or start a new game? Definitely game review. Very habitual routine for me where pretty much always immediately after I'm analyzing the game. And so definitely review my mistakes that way. Why is just capture your knight on f6? How are you more likely to recapture this piece? And here my instinct is definitely bishop captures. You maintain your pawn structure, keep the bishop pair with a really active bishop on f6, and I think you just have a very nice position from there. The thing is if you go with g captures, yeah in theory you could probably attack their castled king on the g-file, but I'm actually a little bit concerned because if we were to take the g-pawn and our rook moves to g8, then queen captures h6 is actually giving up even more material. Now maybe some attackers don't care about one pawn of material if they're going for an attack. The pawn was on h5, maybe I think a little bit more on it. Probably still lean towards capturing with the bishop. Probably both are okay, um, but I'd probably play bishop captures. Have you ever broken anything after a difficult loss? No, I definitely have not broken anything. I try to be very disciplined and just move on to the next game. As far as it affecting you, it's just something that you have to constantly work on. And if tilt is something you struggle with, then again, I have those YouTube videos that I mentioned. So definitely just move on to the next game. Which would you prefer, a brilliant move or a 99% accuracy game? Definitely the 99% accuracy game. The brilliant icon looks really cool whenever you see it in a game review. It's just a really re rewarding feeling when you feel like, yes, I got a brilliant move. But really, that's just one move. And I think, especially the last few years, chess.com has really loosened up the criterion of what counts as a brilliant move. Now, back then, when I joined chess.com in 2017, brilliant moves were actually a lot harder to get. Nowadays, any good sacrifice counts as a brilliant move. And quite simply, I'd much rather take the 99%. Which more accurately describes your opening? I only play openings that I know well and have carefully studied, or I just play whatever was in the latest Gotham chess video. That's kind of funny. I definitely know chess friends that are on either side of the spectrum. I'm definitely the one who only play openings that I've carefully studied. Your opponent has just played King E2. How do you feel? <laughs> well, if it's a serious game, then I'll probably lean towards the first option. Pretty disrespectful that they go with this garbage opening King E2. We'll just play our normal stuff. We'll control the center. We'll develop our pieces. We'll get castled. And with good opening principles, eventually they'll probably regret the fact that their king can no longer castle. So we're definitely going to pounce on this chance and really punish the opponent for playing such a move like this. If it's a more casual game, then I'd be tempted to play King E7 myself. Maybe go for the Nakamura Carlson game. But realistically, I'm looking to punish this if it's played in a serious game. White has a promising knight sacrifice. Knight captures h7, exposing black's king. How would he be more likely to justify the sacrifice? I'm not actually too sure what opening this comes from. It looks like opening theory. I'd probably just lean towards knight captures f7, king captures f7, queen h5 check, king e7, or sorry, king e6, and they're probably just a little bit too exposed. I would have to see if I have enough of an attack for it. I don't see anything conclusive, but their king is just so open, I feel like I probably have enough for it. And so this definitely sounds like I'm going with the first option here. I'm not going in brute force trying to calculate all the way to the end. Their king is just so open that my intuition is telling me this must be good. And I'll just have to navigate the other things as they come up later in the game. Okay, so this position here is actually a position from Alakine's defense. It is the modern Larsen variation. So it's not an opening that I play. Uh, apparently you reach this move order this way. Which actually, now that it's put on the screen, actually looks pretty natural how you would reach this. And so in this position, knight captures f7 is indeed the best move according to the engine. Now, if you sacrifice on f7, king captures, queen h5 check was very natural. The main testing move that I had here was king to e6 to try and hold on to this knight. And now there's actually a few good moves here. So queen to h3 check is a pretty good move. c4 is also a good move. I think I'll show c4 because it's actually kind of instructional where if they bring this knight back, 
then you can actually play d5 check. And after king d6, the main move that you should know here, which I did not know because I don't play this variation, is actually queen to f7. And objectively, this is the best move, which is kind of an unnatural move in my opinion. So now I learned something, and if I ever get into this position, I'll know that that move is actually the way to continue the attack. Which superpower would you rather have? Infinite perfect opening knowledge or fastest mouse speed on the internet? Definitely the infinite perfect opening knowledge. Again, I don't really play bullet that much, and even blitz I rarely play, so I would much prefer the opening knowledge. I would much prefer end game knowledge or middle game knowledge to opening knowledge. I think opening is a little bit overrated, but that's not an option here, so definitely I'll take the opening knowledge any day. In this popular opening position, black is threatening the A2 pawn, how would you respond? I'm actually not too familiar with this exact position here with the rook on c1. I can tell just from the pieces this looks like a Grunfeld defense, probably a main line with the rook on c1. I actually play a slightly different variation here against the Grunfeld defense, where I play my rook to b1, which is kind of an interesting sideline. You keep pressure on the b7 pawn and the half open b file. Um, but in that line, as well as in this line, I would just sacrifice the a2 pawn. So this is all opening theory, I'm sure. And here you'll just get quick development, and if you know your theory, then you should be okay and have compensation for this rook pawn that you've given up. One thing to note is that whenever you give up a pawn, a rook pawn, meaning a pawn in the A file or H file, is actually evaluated slightly less than the other pawns. Because the other pawns can attack two squares diagonally in front of them, but because there is no file to the left of the A file or right of the H file, that means that those pawns control less squares and in theory have a little bit less value. So yeah, definitely castling here and just letting them take the A2 pawn, and then we'll play it from there. Alright, so now as you might recall with the Grunfeld defense, I mentioned that I'm not really too familiar with this rook to c1 line, because I play the rook to b1. And so I'll show you a variation that I was referring to, where it would go like this. I play the rook to b1. Whereas the other position, it was probably bishop to e3 on this move, I'm guessing. And then later the rook probably went to c1, something like that. There's trades on d4 in this line. Queen a5 check. And although it's slightly different than the position we showed, this is what it reminded me of. Because in that position, I don't want to trade queens. Like with the question offered if I want to go into a queen trade. And although it is playable, I much prefer bishop d2 provoke them into capturing the a2 pawn. And if they capture on a2, I am just fully intending to get my bishop out and then get castled kingside. And this way, I am just continuing my development, and the fact that I've given up a pawn is not a huge deal. Imagine you're playing your first ever in-person tournament game. How do you feel? Well, I do play in-person tournaments, and so I know that I definitely just try and feel relaxed. It is a game. Of course, I'm a little excited for it, so I'm a little into it that way. But I try not to be nervous, because everyone is nervous. Definitely my first time, I was slightly nervous, but I was more calm and relaxed than I was nervous. So if I put it like on a spectrum, I was like 80% calm and just 20% nervous. But it does cut easier with time, and now whenever I play a tournament, I'm probably only like 1% nervous. And most of the time, like that 99% of the spectrum, I'm fairly relaxed and I just try and play my best chess. So for my result, apparently I am a machine. <laughs> I actually really like that. Kind of reminds me of like the machine stage from Sonic Spinball. You want to see a video very similar to that where I go over the hedgehog opening in chess. Then you can take a look at that on my channel. But yeah, the machine I really like. Machines are relentless opponents, constantly exerting pressure and quickly seizing on errors from their opponents. Machines love to attack, but they are patient and unhurried in the attack. Letting confidence and good calculation guide their pieces to the decisive squares. Machines are rarely emotional and aren't distracted by flashy moves. They focus on finding the best move in each and every position. That is really accurate for me, especially the part about not getting emotionally affected in my games. And yeah, everyone is different, but I think it's a pretty accurate description. I'm actually kind of curious to see this chart over here. Um, intuition and calculation, I'm pretty sure years ago I was much more on the intuition side. Maybe around here if I had to pick a, some kind of estimate. Or maybe somewhere over here in this range. Recently I've been working my calculation a lot. And so I'm glad to see that my calculation is moving slightly over this way. Very similar to that, I'm sure I used to be a lot more positional. 
but with me practicing calculation more, I've been slowly changing to slightly more attack. So I'm also kind of glad to see that I'm starting to balance out my skill set a little bit. Definitely more on the calm than emotional side. I'm actually surprised that this quiz put me here and not like all the way over here. Some quizzes put me really on the calm side, but you know, I do think that there is a little bit of emotion I have, so this is pretty accurate, I think. And then playful versus studious, I'm like all the way over here for studious. It is just a hobby for me, but at the same time, it is something I try and get good at, and I definitely take my games pretty seriously. So a player like you is Gukesh. I don't know too much about Gukesh's games, I might have to take a look at his games. There's just so many up and coming young grandmasters, and Gukesh is just one of these players. And openings for you, the Queen's Gambit or Carol Khan. And this is exactly spot on. Actually, those openings are both openings I play in my main repertoire. So as white, I usually do play the Queen's Gambit if I'm allowed. And if white plays e4, then I will currently play the Carol Khan with c6. So this is actually exact. So it looks like this quiz is pretty accurate for my personality. Let me know what result you got. You can leave it in the YouTube comments. And I'm curious to see all the different personality types that we have in the comment section. Thanks for watching this video, everyone. I'll see you in the next chess video.